Hi, my name is uh, Justin Collins and I'm the Associate Medical Director at CMR Surgical. Thank you so much for including me in this uh, virtual conference and today I would like to talk to you about uh, CMR Surgical, um, how they have come up with the concept of their approach to robotic surgery and uh, why it's different from other robotic surgical systems and also a little bit about uh, how they can improve uh, patient outcomes and make robot by making robotic surgery more accessible to the masses. So I'm just going to get up my slides here. So the, the title of my slide is CMR Surgical, Transforming Surgery for Good. And this is actually, um, statement that they use on most of the branding and it is an ambition for them to transform surgery for good for the masses. Um, the Versius is their main robot. Uh, this is the robot that they have developed with uh, and it has uh, carts uh, which are independent and go along the bedside. Um, and it also has an open console and, and you can see the open console uh, um, as a sort of two hand uh, controls here for the instruments to control the instruments. Um, and, and these can actually be controlled from either a sitting or a standing position. The court has uh, been designed uh, along the principles of the human arm and it has a shoulder, elbow and a wrist. And you can see that the instrument is uh, uh, doesn't look very long uh, because the uh, the instrument is held as a conductor would hold a, a conducting um, pointer and it, it's held aligned with the hand, which what it actually means is you've got an increased range of movement and, and potentially reach. Um, so this is also a, a smaller a cart than, than other robotic systems, making it more accessible and also a more maneuverable. So you can move it potentially from OR to OR. Here you can see the surgeon sitting down at the, the console. So this is a what has always been called master-slave system where the uh, robot arms are moved uh, directly by the movements of the surgeon. Um, and uh, uh, this is a good ergonomic position. So the surgeon is sat at right angles to the chair uh, and their feet are at right angles. So this takes all the sort of stress whenever you're in a different position, you're, you're leaning forward or leaning your head against something, you can build up tension in your shoulder muscles. And that's been shown in various ergonomic study tests. Um, this approach, the surgeon can sit comfortably with their arms rested and relaxed down at their sides, or they can change the position and, and this whole uh, part of the open console moves can move up um, uh, hydraulically so that it is at a level where the surgeon could stand and operate. Uh, this is just showing you one of the uh, uh, the, the, the movements that this is at the at the wrist, and and we'll see in the video how much movement you can get out of this this sort of approach. The surgical robotic instruments themselves are precise instruments with endo wrists and uh, various ranges of movement so that you can uh, pick up uh, the, the uh, sutures or or use the scissors and use the endo wrists uh, to create the right, uh, correct angles to either dissect or to suture. So this is a big advantage over straight stick uh, laparoscopic instruments. The other thing we can say about this system is that once the uh, instrument is locked and is in position, it is possible to sort of move the, the shoulder joint, move part of the joints to the side to create space at one side of the operating table for uh, the assistant. So this is a small uh, space on the, on the OR floor, but also has maneuverability and stability that we can uh, move the arms uh, so that we can get uh, assistance in safely in between the instruments to help and assist as a bedside assistant. So why do we need robotic surgery? Um, well, 
We believe uh, that uh, minimally invasive surgery, minimal access surgery is better than open surgery for lots of reasons. But uh, here is a typical example of a sort of a large incision so that the surgeon can get through the skin, the subcutaneous tissue and fat, uh, through the muscle and, and get access so that they can get their hands and both their hands into the operating space. Um, a large incision means uh, a longer time for the wound to heal. Uh, it means that uh, there's more difficulty in getting up and mobilizing after open surgery uh, with lifting, with self-caring. So if we're talking about the principles of uh, enhanced recovery after surgery, then we accept that minimal access surgery is a key part of this. You can get uh, the person up and, and walking around sooner and more safely, and also they will get back to normal activities sooner and they can do things like uh, uh, lifting and, and, and bending is obviously easier. Um, so if uh, we, we believe that en enhanced recovery is better for, um, sorry, minimally invasive surgery is, is better for early recovery, um, we also know that um, if you have a pneumoperitoneum, whenever you uh, uh, put the gas into the intra-abdominal space to, to blow up the abdomen so that you could have a, a working space to do minimal access surgery within, that pneumoperitoneum actually raises the pressure to a level that is above venous pressures. Uh, so you actually get a lot less bleeding from the venous uh, system, from venous bleeding. So we know that you also get less blood loss. Um, that means uh, also quicker recovery. And also there are implications with the less blood loss uh, that it saves a uh, people needing transfusions, and there is uh, evidence that uh, transfusions, uh, because it's uh, someone else's blood and, and because the way transfusions work, they can cause a little bit of immunosuppression and they, they may actually uh, uh, compromise oncological outcomes uh, because of that. So the other important thing we always think about with surgery is what are the complication rates? And here we can see that uh, complications in the US 25 billion annually, uh, but is minimally invasive surgery better? And, and we can see that there is a, a, a lower, a statistically significantly lower a complication rate in minimal access surgery compared to open for appendix, for colectomy, for hysterectomy, and for lung lobectomy. Um, so there are less complications with minimal access surgery. Uh, so if it is better for recovery, for blood loss, for transfusions, for complications, why is it not utilized more? Um, if we look at the, this publication, uh, uh, published in the BMJ in 2015, a mean hospital utilization of minimal access surgery showed that it was uh, good in, in procedures such as appendicectomy, uh, was less utilized in, in uh, um, major operations such as colectomy and hysterectomy um, and, and lung lobectomy. So we are seeing I think uh, a period of time where there is adoption of minimal access surgery. Surgeons can see that it is better for the patients, but um, straight stick minimal access surgery is still a challenge. And uh, whenever it was, in, for the early adopters, a lot of them didn't continue to do minimal access surgery because it was difficult to do. And that's because if you're doing straight stick, straight stick laparoscopic surgery without a robot, your movements are actually counterintuitive. So if you imagine that you, your, your, your instruments are, are going into the abdomen through a pivot on the skin, if you want your instrument to go to the right inside the abdomen, you have to move your hand to the left and vice versa. So everything you do is, 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 is counterintuitive movements. So why is it that minimal access uptake remains poor? Uh, um, and will robotic surgery overcome these difficulties with uh, learning to do minimal access surgery with laparoscopic straight stick? If we look at the history of robotic surgery, uh, it was approved back in 2000, so uh, uh, 20 years ago, and yet only 7 to 17% of all minimal access surgery is uh, currently done by uh, robotic surgery. Um, majority of these robotic surgeries are still in urology, so uh, 
radical prostatectomy was the the operation that really uh, gave the legs to to robotic surgery and, and increasingly we're seeing other specialties adopting this now such as gynecology and, and more recently colorectal um, so at CMR Surgical we wanted to understand why people were not adopting robotic surgery so we sent out a Delphi poll uh, to minimal access uh, surgery surgeons and, and these are the issues that we addressed so you can see still in a lot of areas a straight stick is perceived as being better so whenever you compare cost robotic surgery is still very very expensive to to set up uh, to have the, the the service to train the staff to do the service and also the the sort of the running costs of that uh, and part of that is the initial outlay, but it's also to do with uh, the way that we use the instruments that are uh, chipped so that uh, with a, a Da Vinci surgery, you can use the instruments uh, only 10 times. Um, and for something like the scissors, that's very appropriate because scissors often get blunt uh, before 10 operations. But in something like graspers or needle holders uh, in training instruments, we could use those for many more times so there's a there's a real cost there to be considered um, the robot is also large um, so whenever the the first robotic services were launched in certain countries in europe there were examples of uh, the console actually being in a separate room to the or room um, because uh, there just wasn't space for the the, the robots and the, uh, the anesthetic equipment and the stack systems and the console in one room um, when we ask surgeons about uh, haptics, uh, they often say, well, they like the haptics that they've got with the straight stick. Um, no robotic systems really got haptics at the moment. That is something that could potentially come in the future. Um, but as we get into robotic surgery, we've actually got 10, 12 times magnification. And uh, what you're really doing is, is using those visual cues to, to replace haptic feedback. So an experienced robotic surgeon will say, uh, this tissue feels sticky or this bit tissue feels fibrotic when you can't actually see it, uh, uh, you can't actually feel anything. Uh, it's a sort of reverse braille phenomenon uh, where if you're blind, you, you can feel uh, things that align with letters, but here we're actually seeing things that are reflecting sensations. Um, Port size, uh, um, you can have smaller ports with a lot of uh, laparoscopic instruments. We need a certain size of port for, for most of for the Da Vinci robots. Uh, the number of ports um, can be more because we have the robots and the bedside assistant. There is a time and uh, the main increased time is in the sort of the setup and the docking, the draping, all these sort of things. There's a potential for mechanical failure. Uh, we need uh, different energy sources. If you have access to uh, different quadrants, sometimes that's easier to do with, uh, originally that was easier to do with laparoscopic because you just move the, the, the surgeon around and point the instruments in a different way. Whereas with a robot, often you had to undock the robot and put in new ports and, uh, uh, and re-angle to get into the different quadrants. Um, uh, there's the time with the docking and the undocking, the potential for conversion to open and, and uh, the theater occupation. So these are all areas of uh, need that were identified um, that were perceived to not be as good with robotic surgery at the time of this Delphi. So the perceived needs uh, are that we should have a robot. Uh, if, you're, if you're gonna have this initial outlay uh, and this is gonna be expensive, then you don't want a robot to just do one procedure. Uh, ideally, you would have that robot do several procedures within each specialty and across specialties. Uh, you want to get the costs down so that they're equivalent costs to straight stick laparoscopy. Um, one of the ways to do that, of course, is to have the high usage. The most expensive robot is the one that is bought and parked in a, a cupboard and never used. Um, you want the robot to be small and, and able to be adaptable to any theater. Uh, it could be modular, so you could have uh, with these, uh, the CMR surgical system, you can have uh, two carts in, uh, and, and control that, or you could have four, um, and, and you can have different sort of setups with uh, uh, two on each side or three on one side and one on the other. And, and we want it to be quick setup. We want to be able to drape the robot quickly. We want to be able to move it in into position and we want to be able to move it out of position quickly. 
So whenever we looked at this, uh, whenever CMR Surgical looked at this, they, they found that uh, um, these perceived needs were not fulfilled by the current robot. So their solution was to build a run. And uh, Luke Harris, the, the, the uh, chief technical officer, he's still with the company and one of the founders, uh, built this in, in, his, in his garage. And he sort of took the bits of wood and he said, this is how we will develop it so that we have the movements and, 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 and the hinges and these different things. And he created uh, a robotic arm based on uh, the movements of a human arm, which was doing currently the surgery. So this was a logical way to go. And he has, uh, you can see a, a sort of a shoulder here, uh, an elbow and a wrist, and then the sort of the hand that holds the instrument. Um, and here you can see the actual robot. Uh, and and uh, it's, uh, this is the, the shoulder, the elbow, and, and the wrist and, and the holding mechanism to hold the instruments. Another major principle of uh, CMR Surgical is to do good research. We've done uh, uh, multiple papers. Uh, I think we're approaching 100 publications or research areas of work that uh, we're keen to uh, publish as we go along. So we have uh, collected data on um, everything from the cadaver work uh, to the, the engineering work and, and sort of publish, publishing it uh, for the, to gather evidence and, and referenceable material and citable material. Um, one of the approaches we use for research is the ideal collaboration. So this is where you take an idea uh, to, through development, exploration, assessment, and long-term follow-up. Uh, and the aim, of course, is to improve the quality of research in surgery and improve um, safety and patient outcomes. The other aspect that we are keen to uh, improve on is the uh, successful clinical introduction. So we have a very clearly defined uh, um, training curriculum uh, from online modules, uh, which can be done at home, sort of asynchronous e-learning, uh, 13 online modules uh, to develop familiarity with functionality and capability of the Versius, uh, and it helps prepare teams for practical training, and this would be an average of 10 hours to complete. Then we have a Versius trainer, um, which is a, a virtual simulation training uh, with uh, tasks ranging from simple to complex. So sort of uh, a peg transfer through to uh, sort of complex suturing uh, basic skills tests. Uh, every console comes with a virtual trainer and we aim to develop and refine the motor and cognitive skills within these training modules. Uh, and this would take a minimum of six hours. Uh, we also uh, take all our surgeons uh, to cadaveric labs uh, and we have a validated training program there. With uh, the COVID pandemic, this has become uh, increasingly uh, difficult to, for surgeons to travel. So we're also looking at um, more evolved ways of delivering training with 3D printed models to, be, uh, to, uh, to train the surgeons both in um, basic skills training and also in uh, procedural training uh, in, in their local uh, hospital. So our aim is to equip team to be fully competent operating the Versius. Uh, and we have dedicated teams of CMR senior technical trainers. Um, in the hospital, we have a minimum half day uh, operating room setup to, and on also how to understand how Versius fits into your operating room. Uh, and we're working alongside uh, CMR senior technical trainers and customer engagement to deliver this all in an optimized way. So once you've done your device training, your basic skills training, uh, and, and then you have uh, um, hopefully already an awareness of all the, the, the phases and the, the steps within uh, procedural training. Um, we still want to give more support, so we're also doing proctoring. Uh, so in your hospital, you will have independent clinicians providing case proctoring, um, supported by the CMR uh, senior technical trainers as well. And we're also now looking at ways that we can do that uh, remotely and, and give ongoing support with things like telementorship. Um, there's also, of course, ongoing support in your hospital with uh, continuous product support, ongoing customer service, maintenance and servicing. So um, 
this is really trying to align the two issues of technique and technology. And with any medical device, there is a need to learn uh, both how you use that device in your uh, surgical technique, but also becoming familiar with the technology so it is safely introduced. Now, one aspect that we're very proud of at uh, CMR Surgical is the Versius Registry, and we believe this will be a game changer. A robotic surgery is not really robotic. It's, it's not, no, there's nothing automated about it. It's, it's sort of computer-assisted surgery. And when you consider that it is computer-assisted surgery, uh, what you've really got is access to data. So there's, there's data that's coming off the robot, but there's also, you've, you're online and you, and you have access to reporting data uh, that could be linked to the, the, the surgical performance. So we have developed a registry uh, which is real world, which will deliver real world evidence and also a large data set where um, all surgeons can uh, record the outcome data from their surgery. And where we've uh, launched in India, we've done now over 500 cases, we have 100% uh, upload of this data uh, to uh, for the, the, the patient's outcomes. And this is externally verified uh, and uh, um, it'll hopefully help us to identify any issues or problems ahead of uh, trial data. So, so this is real world evidence, but it's, it's almost real time uh, uh, data collection. Um, so I think this is definitely the way to go. And, and uh, I think this will be uh, a necessity for all robotic companies in the future. So I just want to show you now a, a video that, uh, uh, let me just stop sharing a second. Um, so thank you very much for, for listening to this. I just want to show you a video of the Versius so that you can see that as well. So thank you very much again for this opportunity to present. Uh, I hope that has been informative and uh, I'll be available now in the panel to take any questions. Thank you very much.